said, don't forget to take the course. I just did, Brian. <laughs> don't yell at me. Don't come at me, Brian. All right, I think we should be good. Hopefully there's no crazy echo. I mean, I can turn my microphone on. No, I don't do that. <laughs> I hit record, Brian. All right, so you got your presentation. So for those of you just getting on the YouTube, sorry about that, I forgot to hit record. So you have your presentation first. If you look close, you can see the outlined white letter. Um, and then closing questions and then the close. So, <laughs> so there are there are only going to be five possible outcomes when you're meeting with somebody talking to about life insurance. Okay. So if I meet with Brad and I'm sitting down with Brad and I get to the presentation, I give a great presentation. I get to the closing questions, right? There, and I get once I get through this and I ask for the close, there is only going to be five possible outcomes that Brad's going to give me. Okay. So we're going to go over all five of those in just a second. First, we got to go over the closing questions, right? So on your KT, you're giving the presentation, the blue page presentation. You all know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so I give the blue page. You have it. Can I see it real quick? Sure. You guys, a real life copy. It's real. See, if you're on Zoom, it's real. I told you, it's not. It's not a lie. So you have the PDF. Let's hold it up so Zoom can see it, right? So you get all the way to down here. It's upset. No, it's not. I thought it was upside down. <laughs> so you get all the way to down here, right? And you ask the question. Um, and you say to the client, um, you know, so. If I were to give you, you know, if I were to give you the address to Disney World and I, I texted it to you, I just had to jump in the car and drive there. What would you do? Oh, I would put it in my GPS. Okay, cool. So why would you use a GPS and not just aimlessly drive? Oh, because it would help me get there faster, blah, blah, blah whatever they tell you, right? And then I would say, so Brad, you would agree that having a plan is better than not having a plan. Am I right? He's going to say? Yes. Yes. Cool. So outside of yourself, right? So here's the two closing questions. The first one is so brad you would agree that having a plan is better than not having a plan right yeah. so have a plan right so you would agree that having a plan is better than not having a plan right brad says yes awesome so and then the second question is outside of yourself who currently handles your financial planning all right, so one more time, we'll walk through that. Taylor's just hanging out today, so I'm going to ask Taylor the questions. So I'll role play back and forth. So I just talked about Disney World and the address. And so Taylor, if I sent you the address to Disney World and all you have to do is pack the kids up in the car and go to Disney World, how would you get there? What would you do with the address? Put it in my GPS. You put it in your GPS, right? Obviously. Now, why would you put it in your GPS and not just aimlessly drive until you magically end up in the Disney World parking lot? Uh, I don't know where I'm going. Because you don't know where you're going. So Taylor, you would agree that having a plan is better than not having a plan, right? So Taylor, outside of yourself, who currently handles your financial planning? No. Awesome. So after she tells me nobody, I'm going to say, that's great. Believe it or not, most people don't. Most people tell me that also. right? Or most people don't have a financial planner. Most people, blah, 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 blah. Whatever, you're going to relate to her so she doesn't feel isolated and by herself. Because most people don't. right? And once you start running these appointments, those of you that run KTs, you know that most people don't have a financial planner. Right? Most people have no idea what's going on. So cool. Well, Taylor, if we could put together a plan for you with a financial needs analysis, make sure you're heading in the right direction. You're going to get out of debt, be able to retire, all those different things. Is that something that you would be open to taking a look at? Yes. Awesome. Remember the question, right? Is that something that you would be open to? Put open to in the Zoom chat. Everybody in the room say open to. Open to. That is the key question, guys. Would you be open to or yeah, open to taking a look at? Right? So if she says no, well, I'm not going to try to convince her. I mean, I might ask why, right? Like, okay, why not? Like, it's free. It doesn't cost anything. But outside, I'm not going to try to, like, make her do something. I'm not going to put a square peg into a round hole, right? Sometimes, like, people just aren't a good fit uh, from client and from an agent perspective, right? It's just reality. So, cool. Awesome. Well, she says, yes, she'd be interested to it. I say, okay, cool. So what's generally get better for you? Is this time every week usually good for you? Or is there a better time? And then she'll tell me one or the other. So she says this time. Okay, cool. Was is next week or two weeks from now best? Next week. And then I'm putting I'm all I'm doing is moving the appointment. Okay, why? I'm setting a comeback date for the financial needs analysis. That makes sense. So now I'm I'm, I'm going through this and like uh, I'm sorry, this might be I, and, and it's in the back, like what the hell's going on right now? It's just confused. You'll learn it, I promise. But as you're going through the process and as you're going through the information, 
you're going to learn that when you meet with somebody, your, your number one job on the kitchen table is to set the F and A. Okay, set the F and A, right? You should write that down. The only thing that you're worried about when you're meeting with this client the very first time in this very first appointment is to set the financial needs analysis. Are you with me? Awesome. So now I've set the financial needs analysis. We have a comeback day, right? So now what am I doing? Now my job from here is to get to ask Taylor, hey, do you have any old 401ks? Any old investments, blah, 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 right? I'm just trying to figure out if there's any money out there that she needs help with, right? If you're not investment licensed, you still should be asking these questions. Why? Because they need it for the financial needs analysis. So if they're not thinking about this stuff, then they don't know. And also, like, Jenna, if you go on an appointment and you find a quarter million dollars and you can't do it right now, but somebody else can move it for you and you get licensed, you got a quarter million hanging over your head waiting for you to pass your SIE. Is that motivation or not? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's not a ton. Like it's an extra grand ish a month maybe, or a year. Excuse me. It's like maybe an extra thousand bucks a year or so that you'll make an income. But this is a thousand bucks you didn't otherwise have. Right. That's so, awesome. Awesome. right. 20 bucks. 20 bucks. Um, so cool. So then from there, from there, what she's going to do or what I'm going to do after she says yes or no or whatever, it's all the different investment things. Um, I'll gather a little bit of information and then. I'll ask for referrals. So Jenna, hey, awesome. Did you see value in what Brad's going to be doing for people? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, what what do you see was most valuable? I'm just tying down. I'm getting I'm getting her to give me value and reasons as to why she liked what we talked about, right? So so she said she saw value in it. So what you what you like most? And let's say she, the rule is seventy two. Awesome. Don't you think so many other people should know this, Jenna? Who's one person that just had a baby that if they learn the rule of seventy two, be able to set their kids up for financial success long term? Rosanna, I'm gonna write Rosanna down, right? What's the best way to contact Rosanna? Email or phone number best? Why am I asking if email is best? Because it's never best, it's always the phone number, right? I'm not saying, do you have her number? No, what's the best way for you to get in touch with her? Oh, email or phone number? Oh, phone number, okay, cool. So I know she's got her number, right? Okay, cool, uh, what's her number? 724, who knows what area code it is? I don't care, it doesn't matter because she's gonna correct me, right? If I'm trying to get Ed's number, what's your phone number? 517. It's like, no, 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 it's 830 or whatever, right? You're, you're just, you're starting the process. because their natural reactions to then fix it and give you the right thing, right? So I'm getting referrals. So rule of 72, awesome. Jenna, who do you know that just got married? She's going to give me a name and number. I'm getting, what am I doing right now? I'm getting referrals. I'm showing Brad that his one person's leading to more people. Does that make sense? Big People's biggest fear when they get started is not number one, is this going to work? And number two, what happens when I run out of people? If I take Brad to meet with Jenna and Jenna gives, gives us five referrals, are you happy or upset, Brad? Crazy, yeah. Brad's freaking pumped. Not only that, but what we're going to go into next, after I close life insurance, he's going to get paid, have a client, and have five more people to talk to. That's a big win across the board in every category. Does that make sense? You have to get really good at this part of the kitchen table. You aren't closing life insurance right here. Does that make sense? This is not where you're closing business. This is where I'm showing my new trainee because you should never go on an appointment by yourself. This is where I'm showing my new trainee how this works. Does that make sense? Because Brad could take me to see one person, but if I do this part well, Brad's going to have a plethora of people to talk to. Okay? But if all I do is go after the life insurance close and chase the premium, Brad's going to have nobody else to talk to. Brad's going to be pissed and leave and never come back, and his mom's going to cancel the policy three weeks later. It makes sense. We have to show Brad how it works. He might not be a fast starter. That's fine. Right. Or whoever might not be a fast starter. Maybe they are. It doesn't matter. Either way, you've got to follow this process. You've got to get the referrals. You've got to do the FNAs. You've got to set up the FNAs. Do they always show up for the FNAs? No, they almost never show up to the FNAs. But you still set it on the calendar. You tie them down to coming back to it. I can tell you if they come back to the FNA, as long as you're doing what you should, you're closing everything. Like you're, you're closing an investment, a life policy, a PLPP, a will, all that, like everything. Yes. What do you mean they never show up for the SNA? People don't want to follow a plan. They say they do, but they don't want to. So when you tell them you're going to put a plan in place, they're not coming to that meeting. But the FNA gives them a reason to do the life insurance policy right then because we're going to come back and we're going to compare it. If they show up, we, I will every time. If they show up, I will always compare. I will always do the FNA, but they almost never do. It's just, it's just like a nutrition plan. When I've made a meal plan for people at the gym, how often do they follow the meal plan? Oh, yeah. Virtually never. But I made it for them, and the ones that did had really great results. 
So setting the F and A, <laughs> setting the F and A is um, you you do that right after you finish the uh, the presentation. The presentation. The, the, the closing question on the presentation. So as I'm going through the blue page, the closing question isn't do you want to buy life insurance? The close on that is setting the F and A. It's, you would agree having a plan is better than not having a plan, correct? Yes. Who currently handles your financial planning? Nobody. Almost everybody says nobody. There's a couple of other things you might run into there, but we're not talking about that right now. But you got to get them. I'm setting up how you get to the life insurance, right? So now I've gotten the investments. I've gotten, I haven't closed the investments, but I know it's out there. I found that Brad has 75000 over here and his wife has 200000 over here. So I know there's investment money, right? So I know he's got investment money that we need to work on. But now on the way out the door, so Brad just gave me a couple of referrals. I know there's investments. So now the last thing I ask him after, Brad, hey, I appreciate your time today. Thank you for the referrals for Jenna. We'll make sure we call him. Can you please make sure you give Jenna a warm introduction, put him in a three-way text or let him know Jenna's going to call. He's going to say yes. I'll say, great. Thanks so much for your time. And Brad, before we get out of here, I got to ask, who currently handles your life insurance? Just very nonchalant, super chill. Hey, who currently handles your life insurance? And he'll tell me, one of five possible outcomes. There are only five outcomes that you're gonna run into. So here are the five. <clears throat> so number one, is there a single? Single, no kids. Okay, number two, is there married? With kids. I guess the with or without kids doesn't necessarily matter. They have group insurance. This could be like BGLI, SGLI. This could be through their job. It's not theirs. It's through an employer, right? After that one, we have no insurance. So they have no life insurance. And then um, last one is they have another term. We made it work. <laughs> other term. Oh, their term. Oh, their term. <laughs> oh, their term. <laughs> All right. So these are your options. Taylor is, uh, she's over. She's out. She's going to quit. Um, I'm walking home. Um, so these are your five. <laughs> these are your five possible outcomes. All right. So I asked Jenna, Jenna, who currently handles your life insurance? And she's going to say Stop. one of those five things. Okay. So she says Geico. And then now my job, you say Geico. Awesome. So Geico could mean what? It could mean uh, this one. It could mean this one. It could also mean, uh, there's the one I'm, I'm missing one. There's three on here. Single with no kids, married with kids. No insurance, there we go, or cash value. So I guess really there's six. Cash value or whole life. You good? They always, no. they always have to step out for a minute. Uh, but I guess really, oh yeah. There was one, oh well, one full-timer's call that John Cooper just could not. Do you remember that? Yeah. Either of you guys remember yeah. that? Oh John Cooper just could not get it together. And he was just crying, laughing and during one of his presentations. Like he started presenting and he just could not stop laughing. And so he's like, bro, can you take it over? And he's like squealing, crying, laughing. <laughs> oh All right. Anyway, so these are the, these are those really five possible outcomes. I'm going to go with the six here. I jumbled one together and I can't unjumble it in my head. But really, there's honestly, these are six different situations that you might run into. I'm going to hit each one for you real quick. If Jenna says, hey, I have GEICO. With GEICO, what that means is it's going to either be group insurance, other term, or cash value. So now I've eliminated three of them. Does so it make sense? So in my head, I'm like, okay, so there's maybe six things that she's going to say. Now she's like, okay, I got GEICO. Cool. Narrows it down to three. So Jenna, is it through your job? Is it just something that you own privately? Did you get it set up? Like, tell me a little bit about that. I'm going to figure it out. And she's going to tell me when she tells me, now it's my job to be really good at six. Does that make sense? Awesome. So first we're going to talk about somebody who is single. Okay, so you got a single person. So if someone is single with no kids, what are the possible benefits of them having life insurance? Why are there the reasons that they would want life insurance? What do you think? You might be getting married with like thinking about getting married or having kids later on in life. Okay. What else? You guys put them in the Zoom chat too if you want. So their family doesn't have to pay for their funeral. So their family doesn't have to pay for their funeral. Right. Okay. So there are three things on here that there are reasons that you need to know. 
Now you're not necessarily gonna have to tell them all of these, but these are the three, right? So number one is the cost. So let's say like, so Ed, you're single with no kids, yes? Correct. Cool, so let's say I'm sitting down with Ed and uh, when I start talking to Ed and found out Ed's single with no kids, he's got no life insurance. So I'm like, cool. Ed, so there's three main reasons why somebody who's single with no kids would want life insurance. Is it okay if I give you a quick little walkthrough of why that might be? He's gonna say yes or no. If he says no, God bless him, I'm out. Talk to you later. I'll see you in a week on your FNA. And on the FNA, I'll show him why he needs it, right? But in this instance, so he says, uh, he says he's single with no kids. And he says, sure, yeah, I'd love to tell me a little bit about it, right? So first off, um, so for the first thing, excuse me, first thing Ed, is the cost. So cost is based on two things. What do you think those two things are? And then you're going to let them guess, okay? For the sake of time, uh, it's, it's age and health. So you've got age and health. All right, so now I've got age and health here. So as people are get going through time, Ed, are they generally getting older or younger? Older. Older, cool. And I've never met a Benjamin Button, right? I'll make some kind of silly joke about it just to make them laugh. Um, and then generally speaking, Ed, as people get older, are you seeing more or less health complications, generally speaking, over time? More. More. Now, could you get healthier? Sure. But generally speaking, from now, 10 years from now, statistically, you're going to be a little, little bit less healthy. Now, that's the first thing. The second reason, that is um, the living benefit. So they got the living benefit. So you're gonna have a terminal illness benefit of up to 40% without waiver of premium and 70% with waiver of premium. Okay, so we can talk about waiver of premium a different day, but we just need to know this, okay? So you don't really even need to get into this part, it's just living benefit. So my question then after I say, so the second reason I just somebody might want this is because there's a, a living benefit attached to it. So Elliot, you currently have access to a quarter million dollars in the event of a terminal illness that you'd be able to pull out and use in the event of you becoming terminally ill to pay your bills. <laughs> right, right. Now the last thing, Elliot or Ed, let's say um, you passed away. Bring something up with the living benefit too. And just that Go ahead, what? It could potentially save your life too. Right. Like or yeah, it'll cover it'll cover things that the health insurance otherwise might not cover. Like you going to Mexico and getting a surgery that's not approved in the US yet. I mean, there's people in Primerica that have done that because of the living benefit that are still alive, still regional vice presidents because of that. So I'm meeting with Elian or Ed, I'll pick on Elian for a second. So I'm meeting with El and he's single, uh, no kids. So, hey, now there's three main reasons why somebody might want life insurance when they're single with no kids. Number one is the cost. So generally speaking, life insurance is based on two things. What do you think those two things are? And they're going to say, generally, they're going to figure out age and health. And I'm going to kind of guide them to say the two things because when they say it, they're right. If I'm saying it, I'm telling them. If they say it, they're like, it's those two things, right? So I'm going to get them to say age and health. After they tell me that, I'm going to ask those two questions. Are people generally getting older or younger? And then do people generally getting more or less health? And they're going to tell me. Then... The second thing is, um, oh, do you currently have access to 250000 ish in cash that you could use in the event of a terminal illness to pay your medical bills, help keep you alive, pay bills, go to Disney, whatever it is? He's going to say yes or no. Most likely no. Once he says no, I'm going to say, cool. So that's a living benefit. One of the things that we offer with our policy is a living benefit of up to somewhere between 40 to 70% of the base value of your policy in the event of a terminal illness. The last thing is it's to protect your loved ones. So like Ed, if you were to pass away early, that's not going to leave somebody to take care of your house and your car and all your other debts and everything else and your funeral and burial. And you can leave hundred grand back to mom. What's that person going to think about you when, when you pass away and leave them with a check for hundred grand? How are they going to feel about you? And I'm trying to get them to tell me what they're going to feel really good. They're going to, they're going to be really happy, but you're going to be able to change that person's life forever. Right? So those are the three questions for a single with no kid. Any questions? For the three points, excuse me. Any questions here? No. All right. Next. Next. They're married. Oh, I said married with kids. Married with no insurance was what it was supposed to be. That might have been I figured it out. Yeah, I knew we'd get there together. Um, that's a journey, and you're all around it this morning. <laughs> you're along for the ride, Jim. Sorry. Um, all right. So married. If you guys are getting value, just type value in the Zoom chat real quick. Value. I'm feeling value. judged. I'm feeling judged from the Zoom from the class up here. Uh, I'm gonna go back to Zoom. At least Brian's validly cool. Thanks, Brian. Love Wait, you, Brian. we all said value. 
No, I didn't hear it. Uh, all right. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So someone's married with no insurance. Okay. So married, no insurance. So now there's three reasons why somebody would be married with no insurance. This generally means no life. So when you're when you run into somebody that has group life insurance and they're married, you kind of got to combine the two together. Okay. But you need to know both before because group life insurance is garbage. We'll go over that in a second. But they basically, because the group life insurance is bad, they effectively don't have life insurance. Does that make sense? So you got to know both of these and you got to know which way to attack it. Are you following me? So this one is if they're like, dude, we don't have anything, nothing through my job, nothing through work, nothing, nothing private. Okay. So with this one, the three things are no cost. Don't care. This is my favorite one. All right, so these are your three potential outcomes when you're meeting with somebody who's married with no kids. So I meet with somebody who's married with no kids, Scott, and they tell me uh, they don't have any life insurance. And I, so my reaction to them, I'm, remember, I'm sitting in my chair, but my reaction to them is like, what? You don't have any life insurance? And I shut my mouth and I let them respond. I want to see how they, how they react to that. How does that sit with them? What's their response? They're like, oh, yeah, we don't need it. Right, they don't care. But no matter what their response is, I'm gonna go over all three of these things if they'll let me. Right. So I'm gonna be like, well, you don't have any life insurance at all. I'm gonna say yes or no. They'll be like, no, yes, whatever. So now there's three main reasons why somebody wouldn't have life insurance, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Is it okay if I tell you what or is it okay? it's not tell? Is it okay if I walk you through those three potential reasons? Would you be open to it? Yes, awesome, cool. The first one. Mr. and Mrs. Smith is they know that they need life insurance, but they've just never gotten around to it. They're busy. They're at kids' soccer games every night. They got church. They have work. They got 98 jobs. They have all these different things, HOA meetings and everything else. They know they need it. They just haven't gotten around to it, right? So that might be you, maybe not, but that's the first reason. The second reason is people think usually it's like four or 500 bucks when they cover their family. They think it's really, really expensive. And so they just never even look at it. That's the second one. The third one, and you have to be, guys, like, you have to say this like a thousand times because you don't want to come across as like being a jerk. Um, but say, Mr. and Mrs. Client, like, I, I'm sure this isn't you, but believe it or not, I come across people all the time. And again, I'm, I know this isn't you guys, but I come across people all the time that don't care what happens to their family when they pass away. And so since that's not you, right? Everybody say, since that's not you. Since, that's not you. If you don't say that, you're getting kicked out the house. <laughs> so since that's not you, which of the other two is it? Right? So I'm giving them three options. I'm removing one and I'm stuck with these two. So now I just got to know how to handle those two. Super easy. Oh, well, we've just never gotten around to it. Oh, well, today's your lucky day. We can handle that right now. Is it okay if I share my screen and give you a quote? Like, yeah, awesome. And then I quote them, right? And then I close it. Oh, well, we think it's going to be really expensive. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, how much do you think it would be for you guys to cover everything that you would need to cover to take care of it? Oh, well, five, six, seven hundred bucks. You know, we got in a couple of quotes. It was like 500 bucks a person. You'll hear all kinds of crazy stuff. But well, if, so here's the question. If I could show you how to cover your family in a way that, that you could afford and made sense for you and your family, and it protected your spouse and your kids in the event of something happening to you, would you be open to taking a look at that? And then they're going to say yes or no. And if they say no, I'm just going right back to this. Well, you said you know you need it, and you've never gotten around to it, and here we are again, not getting around to it. So when are we ever going to get around to it? If they need, if they knew, if they wanted to have life insurance, they'd have it. But they know they need it. How many of you guys ever like needed an oil change in your car and you just kept putting it off? Anyone? <laughs> you know you need it. That engine is sure as hell is going to blow up if you don't change it. But you're riding right to the brim. That's what's happening with families all over the place. They have no life insurance, and they're just going to work, driving down freaking Dale Mabry. How many of us saw an accident on the way here today? Probably everybody, right? As they're driving down Dale Mabry or down 96, or if they're driving in Lansing, it's a pothole every other corner. Like, dude, you never know. Like, you just, and they're, they're literally waiting, and they're hoping that they don't run into something bad. And your job is to respectfully educate them on why they need it. And if you're really good at this, you'll close everything you go on. All right. Any questions here? 
This is helping you. Yes. 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 Yeah. A lot of people sit there and think that um, they're, they're dead. They don't find out all the money they can So that I think is not All right, let's see. You have, yeah, you have a lock in terms of let them take you, that thought process. You, you can still close those people. I mean, that was one of those. For what? Say that again? They just say, oh, well, I'm dead. I don't have anything to worry about. I don't have to think yeah, about. I, I'm dead. I don't have anything to worry about. What's that sound like? Don't care. I told my mom the other day, because she was like, why am I going to pay for insurance when I can just invest money? Then I'll have it at the end. I said, mom, if you pass away, I take on a six-year-old and all of your bills. I need that money. So yeah, well, here's, here's, that. A lot of here's, here's the easiest yeah. way to overcome that. Well, what, why don't I just invest it instead? Great. You invest 200 bucks today and you die tomorrow. How much money is left for your family? Yeah, and that's what I explained. $197. You take 100 of that and you get life insurance for 250000 And you take 100 of that and you invest it and you die tomorrow. How much is left for your family? Yeah. Quarter million and 97. So now they have $250,097.50. Which one are they going to be happier about? Yeah, you just got to not be able to take crap from people. Uh, I'm not saying you did on purpose. It's just like you just got like it's just practicing. Like I've just practiced this crap so many times. Like you cannot give me something that I can't overcome with life insurance. And I'm about to walk you through one of the ones that you guys probably get stumped on the most. Okay. I got group life insurance. I have it through my job. My job loves me. They care about me so much. <laughs> They're never gonna fire me. I'm never gonna lose my job, and it's the best life insurance ever. Garbage. Number one, trend. Yeah. What? That's my dad. Number two, Mine's working. Number three, active payroll. Number four, living benefit. All right, so I run into a client and I'm meeting with, let's say, a married family. Um, so I'm meeting with a family. Dan, we'll talk, actually, we're going to talk about pre existing conditions. That's a great question. We're going to actually hit that right here. Um, so I meet with a family, let's say I meet with Mr. and Mrs. Klein again, and uh, they have group life insurance through their job. And they're like, oh, no, we don't need it. We have, like, who currently handles your life insurance? Oh, it's through my job. And I would say the same thing. Oh, my gosh, you only have life insurance through your job? I'm just going to see where they sit with that, because most people are totally cool with it. They have no idea. Okay? So I'll be like, awesome. Well, hey, at least you have something. Congrats on having some. So always... Anytime they have any type of life insurance, you can never make them feel dumb for having it, okay? Because they're doing what they think is best for their family, usually, right? So, hey, awesome job. Congratulations on having it. Believe it or not, a lot of people I run into don't even have it. So you already took the first step and you got to do your work. That's great. But is it okay if I tell you a little bit about how that group life insurance policy works? Notice how I'm asking permission every time. Is it okay if I show you how that works? Or is it okay if I walk you through how, because if I'm just like, Jenna, can I, I'm going to tell you why that sucks. And then it's this and this. And this. Like, it's very combative. And you're like immediately, like you're building the wall between you and them by doing that. Right? So you have to say, hey, is it okay if I show you, right? Jenna, is it okay if I show you from over to this side of the table and show you why that's bad? Mm -hmm. Right? I'm trying to physically get on that side of the room with them and show them that I'm on their side. Right? So, hey, I, I'm sure that when they set this up, they went over all, and I'll say it like this too. I'm sure your HR person, when they set all this up for you, they showed you all this stuff, but I just want to make sure you know it, okay? So first off, the trend. So what's the trend right now of employment status, number one, and number two, benefits of the employer? Are people like more and more happy and excited with their benefits or are benefits getting cut left and right? And when you see people outside picketing at like the hospitals and, and nursing homes and the factories, are they picketing, marching around with their signs because they're just so excited about how good their benefits are? Or are they mad that they're getting worse and worse and worse benefits every year? The, the latter, right? Always, always. No one's ever mad that they're getting better benefits. They're always picketing for more money, better benefits, stuff like that. AT&T, two years ago, dropped their life insurance like this for every one of their employees. Every group life insurance policy out the window in 24-hour notice. So all those people have to go down and go get private life insurance. The problem with that is, we'll get to on number three here in a second, is their pre-existing conditions like Dan asked about in the Zoom chat. So the second thing here is, um, the second thing here is working. You have to be working. <laughs> you actually have to be at the job. 
If you're not physically at the job, most group life insurance policies will not pay out. So again, I'm sure they told you that, but if you died in a car accident on the way home from work, it's not gonna pay out. And I can show you in your policy where it says that. And, I, and then they would say, well, really? And I'll say, yeah, do you have access to your policy? Well, no. Okay, well, whose name is on the policy? Is it you or is it your employer's name on the policy? Oh, well, it's my employer. Okay, so if your name's not on it and you don't have access to it, who has life insurance? And you or does your job have it on you? Like, oh, my job's got it on. Okay, cool. Um, you see how I'm just tying them down to realizing that they don't have it, like we talked about before? So it's making sense. The third thing, you gotta be on active payroll status. So so let's say, like, yeah, let's say you're you have life insurance through your work, right? You're, you have police forces, you probably had decent group life insurance, or so you thought until right now, um, <laughs> from the police department, right? Well, let's say that you're not on patrol, but you're sick and you're in the hospital and you have some type of cancer or some type of blood something or other, something happens, you get COVID and you get admitted to the hospital a couple of years ago, right? And you die because of that and you're not at your job. It's not going to pay out because you're not actively on payroll. If you have disability, you're not actively on payroll and you have to be actively on payroll for your benefits to kick in. So if you're not on payroll, number one, and you're not at your job, is this going to pay out, do you think? And I'm going to let them tell me, no. Cool. And the last thing is, with your work-life insurance policy, if you got some type of cancer or something like that, would you have access to a quarter million dollars through your work-life insurance policy to be able to pull out and utilize in the event of some type of terminal illness? And they're definitely going to say no. And then so then I'm going to go back and I'm just going to hit the other no life insurance. So so Ed, since we've kind of established that your group life insurance policy isn't great, really, we might end up just not having any life insurance, kind of, it sounds like, right? Okay, cool. So you don't have any life insurance. So the reason you don't have that is cost. They know they need it. Or the last one, which is they don't care. So then I'm right back into that. One. Does that make sense? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I've pitched my tent here. I'm not going to pinch, pitch my other tent there. I'm just going to hit one, each one of those real quick. And so, hey, most of the time it's cost. Like, how much do you think it would cost? I'm going to get an idea from them, okay? All right, that's the group life insurance one. <clears throat> All right, here's the next two. These are the two where they already have private life insurance. They're already doing the right thing. They're protecting their family. They think they have everything that they need. Um, so now I'm into one of these three scenarios. So do we want to do other term or cash value first? Cash value. Cash value, cool. All right, so they have some type of cash, whole, IUL, or I call them unicorn rainbow life, whatever you want to call it. Anything that doesn't say term life insurance or group life insurance is this, okay? So they got IUL, group life, cash life, whole value, blah, 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 blah. Whatever it is, doesn't matter, okay? They have something not term, something not group, but they have life insurance. Generally, State Farm, Mutual of Omaha, Northwestern Mutual, these are a lot of the big guys, Liberty Mutual, New York Life, you'll see a lot of these whole lives through these guys, okay? These are big whole life companies. Their policies are trash. When you look at them, they're terrible. Um, anyway, so there's three things that you that we're gonna go over, but you need to understand how whole life insurance works. What is the number one um, priority in any business, period? What do they need to have to say open? Okay, they, the clients generate what? Money. Money in the form of starts with P. Profit. <laughs> profit, right? Every business needs profit to stay open. Does that make sense? Those of you on Zoom, the people in the room are struggling this morning. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so every business needs profit. Everybody type profit in the Zoom chat. Say profit. 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 Every business needs profit. So if a whole life insurance business's job is to produce a profit, the when they sell you a life insurance policy, what are they trying to do off of it? Maximizing as much as possible their profit. Okay, so let me be very clear with you. Primerica is also in the business of profit. We are making money off the clients. That's how you get paid. That's how the company stays open. That's how our stock prices are high. Business in general is profit. And if you don't like that, you're probably not in the right spot. You should just go volunteer your time forever and see how that works out for you. Every business needs to generate profit, right? It is what it is. Okay, so now that we've established that, we can move beyond the fact that people have to make money. Now, when a business comes in and somebody has cash value, whole life, life insurance, whatever, let's say that they're paying 200 bucks a month. Doesn't really matter how much they're paying, but they're paying a couple hundred bucks a month into their 
policy. So X amount of dollars per month. So what's happening here is the life insurance company is buying what? They're buying life insurance with some of the money. And then what are they doing with the rest of the money? They're investing it. So if you're buying life insurance and you're paying the company and they are taking your money and buying life insurance and investing it, do you think that they're going to make more money than you are because they're doing this first and then giving you some of the leftovers? Does that make sense? Are you following me right now? It's very, very important that you understand this, okay? Because you're going to meet a lot of people that have this because their cousin sold it to them because their cousin got trained by some New York life idiot that all they were trained on was how to do this and all they were trained on was how to do this and they never actually get an investment license ever, period. I guarantee you there's some people on Zoom right now or even in the room that have one of these policies probably because it was sold to them by somebody that they loved and trusted but didn't understand what they were actually selling to them. We were, but we fell to that. I know other people did. I know we've sat down with quite a bit of Elliot's family that had this type of thing going on. Guys, listen, this is how they screw you over with your money. And a lot of times, I want to be very clear, it's not out of ill intention. The person that sold it to them is generally trying to help them. because that, But that's all they've ever been trained on. And they don't have an investment license, so they can't solicit investments, which we make less money on investments than whole life insurance, by the way. Just be really clear on that. I could sell a $200 a month whole life insurance policy, go make three grand. Or I could sell you an $80 a month policy and a $200 a month pack, and I'll make two bucks a month or more like four or $5 a month for the next forever, however long you invest that, and a thousand bucks up front. Whole life insurance agents want that big chunk up front, and then they get the renewals on the back end every year that continue to come in. For us, we do what's right for the client 100% of the time. When we build our assets under management, that's where your residuals come in. It's not through ripping people off. Okay. So that being said, why is this blurred? Hang on. Can you all see this? Okay. Well, at least you can still see it. What's that? It was real blurry. It was, yeah. Um, all right. So let's understand this. What happens inside of a whole life insurance policy is super simple. So they take their money, they invest it into life insurance, not invest it, sorry. They purchase life insurance. Generally, it's annual renewable term. What does it mean? What does the word annual mean? What does renewable mean? Um, you can use the word to define itself. It, it renews. <laughs> I've got the dictionary. Right? So, so you have an annual renewable term, ART, right? This is the base product in every whole life insurance policy, period. I would bet you every dollar that I, I, that I personally own that is an annual renewable term policy inside of that whole life insurance policy or the IUL, or the whatever the hell it's called, whatever you want to call it. I, I guarantee you the base policy is an annual renewable term. You know how you know that? You go to the back of the policy and you look up the cost of insurance table and every year it gets a little bit, it's like zero, it'll look like this, it's like 0 0.0011 and then 0 0.0012. And it's going to say year one and year two. If it's a little bit more expensive ever, it's an annual renewable term policy, okay? This is usually around somewhere around page 20, okay, when the, on the policy. Now, it's not going to be on the summary of the policy. It's going to be in the actual policy. So, guys, I'm giving you some gold right now. I hope you understand this. Like, this is good. This is going to help you a lot. So, in the policy, now that we've established it's an annual renewable term, what are they doing and taking? Who, who is one of the largest equity holders of Primerica? Does anybody know? Wells Fargo? Vanguard, BlackRock, New York Life, okay? What does New York Life do? They sell this, they buy annual renewable term, and they invest the difference. If they're investing their money into Primerica, what does that mean that whole life insurance policy owners are investing their money in? By proxy, in Primerica, at least in some capacity, into stocks, right? But my point wasn't that they're investing in Primerica specifically, but they're investing their money into stocks and mutual funds. So when we understand this, we're like, okay, they have whole life, so what's happening inside of this policy is they're taking their money, they're buying annual renewable term, which means every year their life insurance cost is getting more expensive. This number stays the same. This number gets more expensive. So over time, this is like a ticking time bomb. This is my bomb. I like that. 
Love that. See, that's actually pretty good for a quick drawing. That's the best thing. Yeah, Elliot said that's the best thing I drew. It is. But so now, so now this is getting more and more and more expensive over the years, and their cash value barely goes up. Okay. So watch. We need to understand a couple of things here. Number one, two to five years. I've actually, I'm going to say seven because I've actually saw one the other day that was seven years. So for the first two to seven years of this client's policy, they're paying, call it 200 bucks a month, and they have called a quarter million in coverage. Okay, now they're paying 200 bucks a month, and they think they have some cash value built up. And what happens is, Scott, they go to Wells Fargo or they go to their insurance company and say, "Hey, I want to pull some of this money out." They cannot access any money because it does not exist for the first two to seven years of the length of the policy. So they're paying money into this policy and think that they're accumulating cash. Five years into this policy, they then have no money to show for it, good or bad. Horrible. If you were to walk into your bank right now and say, I'm gonna open up a bank account and I'm gonna put 200 bucks a month into it. And they said, cool, for seven years, don't come back. Seven years from now, you can come back and then there'll be 200 bucks in there. Are you going there or are you going somewhere else? Okay, yeah, awesome. Yeah, at three years into my policy, I had to pay 11 cents to cancel it. Garbage. Um, so <laughs> horrible. Can someone make a video of whiteboard focus? Can when we're done with this, can you can someone take a picture of this and put it in the telegram, please? And then I'll put it in the YouTube comments so that way it's there as well. So you guys can see what I'm drawing at as it's done. So number one is they have one to two years of that policy that they're paying for and they don't actually accumulate any cash value at all. Number two is loan of somewhere between five and 8%. So now Mr. and Mrs. Client, they wanna go and they wanna go buy a house. Let's say they're 15, 20 years into this policy, they have 20 grand in there. I'm just picking a random arbitrary number. That's not actually what it would be, but let's say there's 20 Gs sitting in there. Now they go take 20,000 out. Uh, they go over to the state farm or whoever, and they say, hey, we wanna take out $20,000. Well, a couple of things. First off, you have to wait, or no, you don't have to wait, but they can make you wait up to six months before you can actually access any of that money at all. So I could walk in, and let's say you're the guy at the counter, I'd say for, I call you, my like, hey, I need, I need 20 grand out of my whole life policy. You could say, all right, cool, I'll start working on that. And you call me back, you're like, cool. Hey, they're gonna mail you that check in six months. I gotta close on my house in a month, good or bad? Horrible, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is, I gotta borrow my own money. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have to go borrow money out of my savings account. Like, I, I mean, honestly, I'll be, I'll be transparent with you. We had we have investments. And a couple months ago, we pulled out a hand, bunch of the investments, actually, to get caught up on a couple of things and pay a couple of things off. And when we did that, I didn't have to freaking borrow it. I'm not paying back an interest rate on the money that we took out of the account. It's just mine. I can go get it. Right? So that's a couple of things there that you got to understand. Um, the thing that you can take a loan from the death benefit. And that you're just left with the remaining debt benefit as a result. Actually, that's uh, that's the last thing I'm going to explain. But that's actually a good point because people think that well, if I take out a half a million dollar debt benefit, right? If I take out a half a million dollar debt benefit, here's this. That's the project. Uh, that's the project. Oh, I'm asking the right questions. We got we got a Jake from State Farm, Snake Farm. What? Ruining our oh, yeah, yeah, Jake from Safe Farm. I'm asking the right questions, y'all. Right? He's like, I don't like this. Don't show him. Uh, <laughs> when you move it, it okay. I will try not to move. I'm sorry, guys. So I'll try my best not to move. Um, that's really hard, you know. Like, um, but I'll do my best. So, so if um if we've got this going on right here, right? So um the loan, I, I go take the money out of it, right? So Taylor's talking about well, a lot of people think what well, a lot of people think can happen, especially in index universal life insurance and IUL or the be your own bank, infinite banking, bull crap that you see all over the internet. Oh, huh? <laughs> excuse me. A lot of people think oh, you. I'm going to die. Oh, they're hacking me. A lot of people think that a lot of people think that you can take a loan out on the death benefit. You can't. You can't. You can only take money out that you've actually put in. And if you're putting in money and only some of it's going here and only some of it's going there, you can only take money out of this side. And if for two to seven years, you don't accumulate any money here, but you think you are, that's terrible. And you're not gonna have anywhere near the amount of value that you think you're gonna have. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's the second thing. The third thing, the third thing is option A or B. 
this is my favorite one to talk to people about because I will literally tell them, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm sure that the agent told you this when they met with you, but did you know that your life insurance policy has only option, death benefit option A or option B? And they're going to say, what do you mean? Because they're never going to have any idea because they never told them, right? So um, and I would say, I would say about a 95% plus of these policies, it's option A or option B. Now, there are some that you get both. Generally, those are like final expense whole life policies, okay? So they're like $10,000, 100 bucks a month, nothing crazy. They're, they're really small. At the, grand, at the end of the day, like whatever, like if someone wants to have that, I'm not going to argue with them. It's still bad, but it's better than most. With this, excuse me, with this, let's just for the sake of argument, this is going to get blurry probably for a second, but for the sake of argument, let's say that they have 250, that's a really bad number, 250,000 in death benefit. And let's say they're 20 years into this guy and they've got 100,000 built up, okay? Gosh, the first day, the first day writing. So, so they have 250,000 in death benefit and 100,000 in cash value, okay? So what's gonna happen here is the death benefit is 250,000. So Scott, the family thinks they're gonna get 250,000, right? Now they have, a death benefit or cash value, excuse me, of a hundred grand. So what's going to happen is if the family has to pick between 250,000 or a hundred thousand, put in the zoom chat, I'll wait. What do you think they're going to take? Y'all can answer 250 or a hundred thousand, 250 all freaking day, right? They're going to take 250. So now the company is going to keep a hundred thousand. So this family thinks they're getting 250, right? Cause that's what dad set up for them on his life insurance policy, but they're going to keep the hundred thousand it gets deducted from the death benefit. So that family is only going to net 150,000. Now, well, that's 150,000 more than they would have if they didn't have any life insurance at all. Sure, I'm with you. Better than nothing. But you're outrageously overspending in this. Right? You're spending way more than you need to for 100 grand less than you should have. All right, now insert the other numbers however you want to. That is generally how this works. I'm sure there are questions on this. Who wants to ask the questions first? And can you watch the chat? Someone with Zoom, if someone put your uh, question in the Zoom chat real quick, I'll give you about 30 seconds to write it up. Does anybody in the room have a question or want something clarified? Is this helping you guys? Yes? Good. Awesome. I'm going to slowly erase this. Oh, wait, wait, make sure. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait. I took the quote. That's a beautiful picture. Did you like it? Yeah. You're welcome. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Any, any Zoom questions? Did anybody ask a question in Zoom? No. All right. All right, ready? Last one. Thank you. Wait. Yeah. Do they lose the cash value when they cancel whole life or is it refunded minus fees? Uh, depends on the policy. Generally, it's refunded minus some surrender charge. After like 10 years, there's no surrender charge. Um, I've seen policies that are 25 years old that the surrender charge is still equal to the cash value. So they still, yeah. So yeah, sometimes they will lose all of it. Um, but you ask them, I mean, hey, do you want to lose all of your money when you die or do you want to lose all of your money now and make the change and so you have something built up later? That's rare. That doesn't happen very often. I have New York Life, Northwestern Mutual both do that. Um, not all of them, but some of them, the really bad whole life policies are structured like that. Um, not all of them, but most of them are going to have option A or B, and the surrender charge goes down each year for 10 years, and then it's nothing. Some of them, the surrender charge goes up for a decade or two or three. I've seen as much as 30 years with the surrender charge is the same as the cash value, which means that you sign the contract, and for 30 years, you're never getting a dime out of that. The only thing you can do is loan it. And here's the problem with that, guys. The index universal life insurance policies, people think they can borrow against it and be their own bank and somehow magically like be rich tomorrow because they put $100 into a life insurance policy. Um, first of all, I don't understand that, how you can even think that that's a thing. Second of all, <laughs> the problem with that is if you borrow the money, it's tax-free. You don't have to pay any money on the taxes. Do you have any of you ever had to pay taxes on your, your mortgage? No, you pay taxes on the property value of the house that you're purchasing. 
that makes sense? And you pay taxes every year based on the amount of money that you, or the amount of property that you own. So and I might not be exactly right there, but you're paying based on the thing that you're purchasing. When you borrow money, the money you're borrowing is not taxed. So when you take money out of your life insurance policy, that money is not taxed. But what happens if your life insurance policy lapses? Now you're taking out money out of an investment vehicle, quote unquote, that's how the IRS is going to look at it. If your policy lapses, now you pay taxes on the lump sum that you took out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they're going to sell it to you as it's a tax-free investment vehicle and blah, blah, blah. If, no, if the policy lapses, the money you took out is taxed. Almost every time. Again, not 100% of the time. Some policies, they have workarounds with it with different riders and things that are set up. Generally speaking, if a policy lapses and you have a loan out on it, now you got to pay taxes on the loan and whatever else you took out of it. But if it lapsed, you didn't probably didn't take anything else out. So, yeah. If they have a terminal illness, are they able to access any percentage? It depends on the policy. It depends on if that's included. So I don't know if you guys could hear that. I said, if they have a terminal illness, can they access any of it? I don't know. A lot of people in that instance, they will pull out their cash value to pay the pay the stuff. But when they do that, a lot of times their, their cost of insurance has continued to go up every year. So in order for it not to lapse, they have to pay back the loan value and the premium, which because there's no cash for it to pull the premium out of, like this bucket is empty because they withdrew all the money or as much as they could. There's nothing for it to pull out of. So their premium is now even more expensive plus the interest. So now say they're paying hundred bucks before they might be paying two or 300 just to make up for that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that helpful on Zoom? Thumbs up if it's helpful. Cool. Hope we all are learning something today. All right, last, term life insurance. They have a, a different term. They got term from a different company. This is one of my favorite ones because it's the hardest, in my opinion. I like challenges. So someone comes to me and they just throw their fast start plan around me, right, Ellie? They're so, they so excited and they just throw everything across the room. So uh, no, but but somebody comes that you're sitting down with them and they're like, well, Dan, you know what? Maybe maybe I'll do this and maybe I'll get that. But I definitely want to keep my other one. It's 30 bucks a month. It's 15 bucks a month, whatever. I got a half a million for eight nickels on every third month of the year. Cool. Great. Awesome. It's another term policy. So there's three big reasons why this is not great. Um, again, hey, super proud of you, super excited for you, blah, 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 blah. You already have it, great. So there's three main reasons why somebody would have that or why this is not great, okay? So you have a different term policy. Is it okay if I tell you what the problems would be with that company's term policy? They're gonna say, sure, yes or no, right? So number one, the renewal cost. Number two, uh, the conversion to permanent, AKA whole life. And then number three, health. All right, so let's talk about each one of these real quick and I'm gonna draw you a picture. So if a client says, well, I already have term life insurance through XYZ company, I'm paying $7 a month for $9 million in coverage. Great, amazing, super happy for you, right? So awesome, but again, I'm glad you have it. Great job having something. Is it okay if I walk you through why you might wanna consider switching to a different term policy? Would you be open to that? Yes, I would. Okay, great. So number one, the renewal cost of your policy. Now, I don't know if your agent told you this or not. Hopefully they did. Most of them do. Is that when this term ends, you're going to have an option to either cancel it, which means you no longer have it. So it lapses. Or if you wanted to keep your term insurance, it's going to be anywhere from eight to 45 times as expensive each month. So you're paying $10 a month now. It's going to go up to 80 to 450 bucks a month. Did you know that? Oh, no, I didn't know that. Okay, cool. Like, Grab your policy. I'll show you where it says that. Every time it's there, page 10, 11, 12 ish, roughly in that general area. Okay, that's number one. Number two, conversion to a whole or to a permanent or whole life or cash value or whatever, something not term. Right? So at the end of this, the only policy that you can convert to is a whole life or a permanent life insurance policy. And Mr. and Mrs. Client, just a couple minutes ago, we talked about how whole life insurance is bad and how you're overspending for what you need. Um, so you would agree that whole life is bad, correct? Yes? Great. Why would you want to convert to that later? 
Well, I don't. Okay, cool. So then you establish that that's bad, right? The last thing is health. So again, life insurance costs is based on two things. What are those two things? Age and health, right? Cool. Are you generally getting older or younger as your term policy gets older? If I'm getting older. Are you getting more or less healthy as your term policy gets, gets uh, older? Getting less healthy. Awesome. So if you're going to get a little bit less healthy and a little bit older, is it going to be more or less expensive for you 10 years from now when this policy expires for you to get more coverage? Or would it make sense for you to get something now that's going to lock you in at a cheaper price? No. Well, it would make sense now. Okay, great. So just that alone, a lot of times is enough to at least get an application from them. If you're if you walk them through those three things and you really have done a good job of explaining it to them. So let me walk you through each one of these. So the renewal cost. Does Primerica have a renewal cost in the back of their policies? Yes. yes. It does get more expensive. Okay. Not 45 times more expensive. Never. The most I've seen is seven times more expensive than that first year. Every year it does go up a little bit. Okay, so you do need to understand that. Like it is going to get more expensive. It is a term policy. It's not some magical like Harry Potter policy out here that's just like taking care of everything and it's amazing and perfect. It's the best, but it still does get more expensive at the end of the term. If your clients follow their plan, your plan, they're not going to need the life insurance. Are you with me here? Mm -hmm. So we're setting them up to have success for when they don't follow the plan because most of them aren't going to, but some will. Okay. So now. So now from there, um, we're going to convert to permanent. So, okay, cool. So now your policy is over, so you can convert to permanent. Well, with Primerica, you actually have, we're the only policy, the only company in the entire country that will allow you to convert your term policy to a different term policy. So since whole life is bad, would you, would you want the option on the end of your term to be able to convert it to another term without a medical check? Would that be a benefit that you would see value? In? Yes, great. And then the last thing is, if we could lock you in right now and you would never need to do another medical check, is that something that you would be open to looking at? They're going to say yes or no. Hopefully they say yes. Great. Awesome. So now we've established this. Okay. So now let's talk about the other thing. If they're like, no, I'm good with all of this. Like that makes sense. I'm not going to need it. Um, the question that I asked them in this instance is, Mr. and Mrs. Klein, are you 100% sure? Right. Are you 100% sure? That at the end of your term, that you're going to need exactly zero life insurance going forward. And they're going to say yes or no. Most of the time, they're going to say no. Right? Okay, cool. Well, here's the problem. Right? Right now, your life, I'll do it in black actually. So, your current life insurance policy, and this is uh, coverage amount, and this is time. So, let's say they have a 20 year term for like, let's just call it a half a million just for the sake of argument. So, they have a 20 year term for a half a million, and let's say they're 50. So, this is only going to take them until they're 70. All right, you guys follow me here? So, they've got a half a million until they're a 20 year term. Uh, this day, right here, Mr. and Mrs. Klein, this shows me that on day or year number 19, day number 364, you needed a half a million in coverage. On year number 20, you need no coverage. Is that how it usually goes with your investments? Are you just going to accumulate a half a million dollars overnight? No, I'm not. Okay. So what this looks like is this is the plan of I just hit the lottery, and that's my financial plan. Now, are you planning on hitting the lottery 20 years from now? No, it would be nice right to joke around, right? You say, well, that'd be awesome, but we're not going to plan on that. So cool. So now they're, we're in this predicament here where we got this situation going on. So we've hopefully talk a little bit to them about the theory of decreasing responsibility. When you're younger, you need more coverage. As you, when you get older, your cash should build up, right? So down here, this is your cash value that builds up over time, right? And it should never do that, but let's you know, I did that, but you get the point. And then this is going to be their need for life insurance. It's going to basically have an inverse relationship to that, right? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Sorry if you guys can't see that super well on Zoom. Um, that blue sucks. Is it this one better? No. I'll just do it all in black. You guys can figure it out. All right. Is that better on Zoom? Yes, yeah. better. Okay. So, so this line represents their need for life insurance. This line represents their cash value. Okay. So at this point right here, 20 years from now, they really only need, call it like 300 k and life insurance. They don't really need a half a million. So if I wanted to set them up and if I said, Mr. and Mrs. Klein, if I could get you into a vehicle 
that better suited your financial needs going forward and helped you be able to make sure that this step down as your as your need for life insurance step down, your costs also step down, and you could take that money and invest it, and it would be able to kind of maximize your investment dollars. Is that something that you would be open to? And if we could make sure you had conversion to term at the end and it didn't explode on you on the back end and you had medical insurability forever, would you be open to it? They're going to say yes. So what I would suggest is that every single dollar that they have right here is unnecessary money that they, they're like overspending on life insurance on all of this, right? So we have to understand that our policy is going to have something like this where in year 21, it's going to come down to like here. And then it's going to go like this and it's going to decrease. It's going to mirror that, that theory of decreasing responsibility in some capacity. And that varies on health and age. I've seen policies that in year 20, like for this instance, like in year 20, they have 500,000. In year 21, they have 450,000. I've also seen some where they have 500,000 in year 20. And in year 21, they have 250,000. Just depends on their health. And you can't tell them one or the other which one it's going to be. That's why you need to take the application. So that way you can have something to compare to them. Because if you don't have something to show them, you're just fighting a ghost with a different ghost. Right? You're like, oh, this sounds great, but well, you have nothing to do. The dog got real excited. He's like, close it. <laughs> so, so when you have this, now what I would do instead, I would still do 500000 on you know a 10-year term. So I got 500000 here. Right, so now for this client, we have five hundred thousand on a ten-year term. This ends; they can cancel it or keep it. I don't care, right? But then I have another one down here, so I have two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a twenty-year term. So I've got two fifty on a ten-year term and two fifty on a twenty-year term. Sorry, I did that wrong. So right here at this like cross point, this ten-year term falls off, and they can keep it or convert it if they want to. If they want to keep it, what's going to happen? Value is going to come down, and the line is going to go to a hundred. Does that make sense? So we're trying to mirror that theory of decrease in responsibility as best as we can. This is how you crush every other term policy, especially if they're paying a lot for it. Like if someone's got, a, like I don't care who you are, if you're paying 30 bucks a month for a half a million in coverage, that policy is trash and it's not going to pay out. There's so many, like I could just, with very much, with a ton of confidence, I can tell you that that's not paying out. If you're over like 30 years old, there's something in there. It's something's broken inside of that thing. It doesn't make any sense. Mathematically, it makes no sense because that you want to put in the Zoom chat. You all can say yes or no. Do you want your life insurance to pay out if you die for your family? Yes. yes. Okay. Would you be willing to pay an extra couple dollars a month to make sure that it was going to pay out? Yes. yes. Okay. So pay a little bit more. Make sure you have what you need. So guys, I hope that was helpful. I want to open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions at all about any of the things that we went over today? Type it in the Zoom chat if you do, because you all are not able to unmute. Anybody in the room? Have any? No, sir. That must have been good. Yeah, yeah, I'm just pretty well. tired, dude. There's a question. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Scott, our system when we quote it, it allows you to it allows you to quote it out and like build that for a client. Um, you can't see the you can't see the exact numbers and stuff like that until they do a medical check, but you can build the scenario in the financial needs analysis software, I guess. Any other questions? All right, guys, if you got value out of today, go in the Telegram and type value. All right. Love you all. Hey, look, guys, we're in the top 25 still right now in the country. We got to get in that top 15. We, like, there's a lot of